American urban malaise. And, and King of Comedy is really about, you know, the underbelly of, of fame and like our, our, our obsession with achievement and television and fame and being known and stuff like that. And, and in that sense, I feel like Travis Bickle and Rupert Pupkin are, are really, really close cousins as performances you know they're, they're and they're and they're like i think they're just really really fantastic seminal pieces of work but are there, is there a scene in, in king and comedy that made you kind of go oh my god what's there's a great scene in that movie that to me it, it totally captures that what they're exploring it's where where jerry lewis who's equally great in that movie kind of makes the decision to go out of his building and walk instead of running into the car and he and it's like he gets out and a cab driver goes by and yells something at him about the show and he sort of says oh i could have used you last night blah 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 and then a, the construction workers far away yell at him and, and he's nice and he waves back and as he goes down the street he ends up passing this phone booth will not believe who's coming down the hill jerry langford right right oh morris please hold on jerry would you please sign my order i'll stop signing that magazine for me yeah you're just wonderful i've watched you your entire career a joy to the world please morris would you just please say something to my nephew morris on the phone he's in the hospital i'm and sorry i'm late you should only get cancer i hope you get cancer and, and in that one scene it goes from we love you to I hope you die if you don't give me what I want. You know what I mean? And it's just like, that's it. That's fame. That's fame in America. It's like, it's like they absolutely love you until five seconds later, they're wishing cancer on you. You know what I mean? You're talking about influences, and we can't sit here and not talk about you having worked with an actor who's probably the biggest influence of in anybody in, 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 in film and Mar being Marlon Brando. Yeah, and I think you would be hard-pressed to argue that that he wasn't the most influential actor on many subsequent generations of American, not, and not just American film actors, all film actors, all actors. He, he, even though I think he never wanted to be saddled with it, he, he, he was one of those people who landed at the crosshairs of a moment where both what was going on in the culture, a sea change, a, a shift that the culture was ready to embrace anyway, m crossed with his talent, his very unique talent at a moment, and it ended up, it ended up turning him into this incredibly, incre incredibly influential kind of um, paradigm-shifting artist. He well, was he aware of how he must have been, of course, but how sort of he rom romanticized he was by Kazan and on the waterfront, how he's really sort of made, he's, he's both sort of this tragic hero and an ingenue simultaneously. I mean, do you talk to him about that kind of stuff? I didn't, no, not about that specifically, but something you just said is really interesting to me because you, you very rarely hear the word ingenue used to describe Brando. I mean, that's, that's like, I, but I think that's really insightful because if there's something that gets done to Brando that I think's like too reductive, it's that because of his big physical beauty, you know, last tango in Paris, these things, he's, he's seen as this iconically male figure. And because what he did that really, you know, just blew apart people's notions of what a screen performer was had so much to do with the way he was sexualized, you know, with, with that brutish yeah. masculinity that he brought to the screen with, in Streetcar. People miss that the real magic of him is that he's got this incredibly poignant vulnerability yeah. in him. It's like the most famous moment in Streetcar and in like half of American movies is when he screams her name. That is not a macho piece of acting. You know what I mean? He's weeping and he falls to his knees like a little boy. And she comes down and holds his head in her lap and, and he cries and says, don't ever leave me. You don't ever leave me, baby. <laughs> when, you, when you start out as a guy in acting, a lot of what you're drawn to is a sense of, like, power in these performances, you know? You're, you're drawn to, like, Denzel and Glory and, and, and De Niro and Raging Bull. And but that sense of danger that all comes from Brando. Well, yes, and, and Marlon Brando and Streetcar Named Desire, all these things. Because there's something in you when you're young, you want to 
perform that way. You want people to see your strength in a way. You know what I mean? Sure. And the, the more I go on, the more I work, the more my whole, my appreciation gets deeper and deeper for what I would say is like the, the hardest thing in acting, which is conveying that kind of vulnerability. But he, the thing that was kind of amazing, the reason I say Anjanu is because he listened in a way it was very different the way that the other actors listened before that. Yeah. I mean, not the one front. Yeah, I, I think he, I, I genuinely think that as much as you can uh, say that someone changed everything, I think he changed everything uh, as, as far as acting. And, and by the way, the interesting thing is, I talked about this one time too, uh, there, was a, there was a thing, uh, an AFI thing for Dustin Hoffman, and, and, I, and they asked me to talk at that, and I started, so I thought about like, I thought about what Dustin Hoffman had, you know, and had meant to me, and he was such the antithesis on many levels of what had been a leading man up to that time. And that's kind of what I said. I think that people like me um, and Phil Hoffman and, you know, uh, Sean Penn and any number of actors today who aren't what you would call sort of matinee idol guys who are actors, people like Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino and Robert De Niro and Robert Duvall shifted the paradigm from um, from quote unquote leading actor, romantic leading actor, to character actor. They turned the character actor into the leading actor. Um, you what, know, what were some of the Hoffman films that was? The, I guess The Graduate was obviously one of you, wasn't it? The, yeah, the, my my parents loved. I did see The Graduate early on, and just just could never get over that movie. I, I thought it was. I still think it's one of the greatest greatest movies ever. Um, but I, I, I loved uh, Lenny. I think I thought Le Lenny, to me, at a young age, you know, Lenny's an incredibly raw film, really raw performance. Feels almost like a, a documentary, you know. It's, I thought he was incredible in that. Are there any niggers here tonight? Let's see. There's two niggers, and between those two niggers sits a kike. And there's another kike. That's two kikes and three niggers. And there's a spick, right? Hmm? Ooh, there's a wop, there's a Polak, and a, oh, a couple of grease balls. <laughs> and there's three lace curtain Irish mix, and there's one hip, thick, hunky, funky, boogie. Boogie, boogie. Mm hmm. I got three kikes here. Do I hear five kikes? I got five kikes. Do I hear six spicks? I got six spicks. Do I hear seven niggas? I got seven niggas. Sold American. <laughs> you almost punched me out, didn't you? <laughs> well, I was just trying to make a point, and that is that it's the suppression of the word that gives it the power, the violence, the viciousness. The editing is just... It's, it's almost themselves. violent. It's yeah. like there's a violence in his editing. But well, the editing is really set to be as assaultive as his as his yeah. style is as a comedian. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the the film reflects the the subject in a way. I, I guess I'm wondering about actresses. Are so you talking about this sensitivity that you responded to in, in Brando and in Dustin Hoffman? And there must be actresses that you responded oh, to. Oh, sure, too. sure. Um, I mean. You know, I was actually just with a friend, we were, I was talking with someone about Out of Africa the other day, because that's a movie that for me really holds up as an amazing piece of work. And, and the whole thing's anchored in Meryl Streep. I mean, people don't talk about Meryl Streep and Deer Hunter because they tend to just talk about, you know, all the... Chris John, Walken or John, John Cazale Cazale and yeah, John sure. all these people. But she's so great in that movie. Her longings are so, are so palpable and so painful. Are there other actresses? I just wonder who... I, I always, I gotta say, I always thought that Faye Dunaway was, well, Faye Dunaway had a run, you know, from Bonnie and Clyde to Chinatown to Network, Mommy Dearest. She was putting some performances down that when you go back and look at them, when you think about what actresses get put through in terms of sort of the, the beauty complex and the thing, she was like, she was, she was, really daring she was being really daring in these performances she was she was daring to look like ridiculous daring to be um you know insane in a way you know what i mean that performance in mommy dearest was really kind of almost like watching kabuki theater done as opera i mean it's it's, it's so brave like you have to you're risking a lot you know what i mean you're putting stuff out there that you know it, the, the 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 critique is going to fall on you 
you know, if somebody hacks that together the wrong way. Sure. And I admire people who throw it against the wall that hard and say, let the chips fall where they may, you know, like I'm going to go for it. And I think some of what contemporary generations of actors risk losing sight of is that, is that there, you don't want to abandon theatricality. You, you don't want to abandon performances that are larger than life. Being naturalistic isn't the same as, as being, um, you, you know, you're... But naturalism is a style. It's a signature. It, it's yeah, anything it's a, else. It, it is, but, but it's like... Um, I mean, which means like, you can sorry, be bigger with it. Absolutely. Uh, it, it can be, yeah. Was that a tough lesson for you to learn, though? I mean, because you came up kind of the tail end of that generation when people were talking about sort of like taking that thing which actually makes you smaller, not understanding that we go to the movies for a reason. You know, we don't want to really see our lives. You want to see the lives of people with some drama in there. I agree. You want to see sharply drawn characters. Yes. Um, that's what I mean about the mistake of interpreting. What, I mean, it's a mistake to look at all those people, you know, Pacino and, and Hoffman and then the, the De Niro and these, and, and, and for young actors to look at them and go, oh, you know, they're, they're, so, they're so gritty and low-key and cool and not see how heightened those performances actually are. Really? Because it's, it's amazing that you can miss that sense of menace that came through almost all those guys. You know, you're talking about even Hoffman in, in Midnight Cowboy. You know, I mean, this guy thought he belonged there. You know, he thought he had, he had a purpose. He thought he belonged there as much as Joe Buck did. Yeah, and uh, talk about directors who, who are wonderfully open about their influences. Spike Lee is like, uh, when we made the film The 25th Hour, almost every night at 8 o'clock, Spike would screen a movie. And um, one night he shows Midnight Cowboy just because he was like, um, he, he, he said, he goes, I, I just, they were doing things the way they shot the city. Um, Rodrigo and I want to look at it. And I was sitting behind Spike and we watched Midnight Cowboy. I hadn't watched a print of it in a long time. And it was so sensational, like, so sensational. Like, if, I mean, if that movie came out tomorrow and it hit the screen and none of us had ever seen it, I think we would go, that's one of the most radically modern movies, you know, anyone's seen. It's so bold, you know, like, it's just so, it, it's gritty, but it's also, like, you know, I mean, that thing where they go into the Warhol party and the screen goes down to the 16-millimeter movie camera size, and it's just, there's, there's so much good stuff in it. And, and we watched the whole movie, and the, the, whole, the whole time we were screening it, I was seeing Spike leaning over into the DP's ear and going, blah, 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 like that, you know, watching it cackling now and then. And when it ended, when it, when it ended, like, Spike jumps up and turns around to everybody and he goes, Ha! Still a motherfucker! <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and everybody, everybody just started laughing. And he, it was like, it was like, you could just see, like, the joy on his face. He was like, he, he was like, to him, I think, that, that, he was like, I'll never make a movie that good. You know what I mean? And that's, like, it's awesome. You got to have those ones you got to have those ones that mean that much to you because then then you, you you're still trying to shoot for something i think you know cool well we're out of time and thanks so much for being here anytime thanks so much you can joke about it angel but someday you'll find out who your friend is what an imagination that's from writing movies that's from counting money. That movie was like a hand grenade. I could not hit the mark and say my line.